The argument today as we talk about the American Bill of Rights is this. It's not about individual rights. Now, I bet that if I went around the room and pulled each and every one of you and asked you right now at the start of this presentation, why is the Bill of Rights important? I would bet that every single one of you would say something to the effect of the Bill of Rights protects my individual rights. And maybe that right is to own a gun. Maybe that right is to um, say something that's wildly unpopular, but you have that right. And I'm thinking like, for example, the, the famous case of Nazis who wanted to march on Skokie, Illinois. And they can, right? Because even though they have really unpopular speech to present to the world, they have that right to do it. That minority political voice has a right to be heard. And that's how we usually think about the Bill of Rights. But my argument for you today is that that's not the original purpose of the Bill of Rights. And in fact, the first 10 amendments to our constitution, which constitute our Bill of Rights, in fact, the original purpose of those 10 amendments is instead to protect the majority's rights, the collective, we the people, our rights, and as well as the rights of the states. Protect against what? An overreaching central but national government. That is the original purpose of the Bill of Rights. Now, I don't want you to hear me say that and think it's wrong or that James Madison and the rest of the framers and ratifiers of the Bill of Rights would think it's not appropriate for the Bill of Rights to protect individual rights. Of course, that's fine, but that's a secondary effect of what the actual Bill of Rights is originally intended to do, which is again, to protect the majority's rights, the collective, we the people, our rights. Now to make that case for you today, I am going to first discuss some context, um, some really important principles and historical context that help us to think about the Bill of Rights as a document aimed at protecting states and majorities' rights. Then I'm gonna talk about a sort of secondary layer of the Bill of Rights, um, institutions uh, that are super important in the 18th century that protect we the people and how the Bill of Rights therefore is especially interested in protecting those institutions because of how they work in favor of we the people, this majority that the Bill of Rights is so concerned with. Okay, after that, I'll take your questions. And in our primary source part of this hour, as far as we can get along through the document, we will go through the different amendments and the different clauses and talk about how each of these applies to this argument about majority's rights and can also be seen the way we normally do as a protection for individuals. And that's how we're going to spend the hour. So first off on this slide, um, my argument is I'll let the, up at the top of the screen, right? The Bill of Rights is really meant in its original design is, is meant to protect the majority's rights and states' rights, not individual rights. So I have selected a few, this is not an exhaustive list, but a few different contexts for us and influences for us to consider. Okay, first of all, for the framers and ratifiers of our American Bill of Rights, all of them had in mind the sort of OG Bill of Rights, the English Bill of Rights of 1689. This is absolutely a model for what a century later will become our Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights is a kind of constitutional capstone to a century of constitutional struggle in England. And it's a really great story. So, I mean, I love to teach it. I love to talk about it and think about it. It's got everything, it's gotta be heading, it's got civil war, it's got restored monarchs and kings fleeing in the middle of the night. It's, it's an amazing story. 
But that story boils down to a monarch wanting to have absolute power versus a parliament who want to have say in how government operates. They want to be consulted routinely. They want to give their consent to what government does. And this struggle happens throughout the 17th century and finally culminates in a, an event known as the Glorious Revolution, which all of the American founding generation, they all know and, and think about the Glorious Revolution because with the Glorious Revolution, the king's power was limited and parliament became sovereign. So parliament wins that power struggle. And the English Bill of Rights is written at the end of that revolution and given to the new monarchs, William and Mary, offered up by parliament and they agree to it. Well, what does the English Bill of Rights do? It one, limits the power of the monarchy. So limits that central government and all of its agents, as well as protects parliament and gives parliament liberty, uh, different freedoms, uh, different rights rather, like for example, the right to have free speech in debate. So this English Bill of Rights looms large in American constitutional history, but notice that it's not a Bill of Rights meant to protect Joe Schmo Englishmen on the streets of London. It's a Bill of Rights to limit the power of the monarch and protect the power of parliament. So that's the first important context we should keep in mind. Next up, the flurry of state constitution making that happens in the wake of the American Revolution here in America. So our uh, colonies turn states, as soon as we decide we're independent, they all have to think to themselves, oh, are we going to um, keep our old colonial charters? And really, I think it's only like two states decide to do that. The rest of the states think, all right, now that we are free of king and parliament, how would we like to be governed? And the answer that a lot of them come up with is, in various different ways. It's truly, this, this period in time is, is one of the best moments um, uh, to see states as um, what Louis Brandis Boyd once referred to as the laboratories of democracy, because really all of the states are doing different things. New York's doing a different thing, then Virginia doing a different thing, then Massachusetts, et cetera. But in this flurry of constitution making, what you end up seeing is a real pre preoccupation with limiting the executive power. And executive power is usually a, a, not only the governor of a state, but also the judiciary. They're seen as one and the same, holdover from England. And in favor of legislative power. Now, what does that have to do with bill of right, bills of rights? Well, first of all, it's not quite clear to all of those different states who are making constitutions that you need bills of rights. In fact, um, one of the dominant arguments that you'll hear from men like Alexander Hamilton uh, is that uh, the constitution itself that you're drafting is a bill of rights. Why? Because it limits the power of government and that fosters liberty. Still, however, there are some states in this flurry of constitution making that decide, well, we want to add on a Bill of Rights. And states like, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but North Carolina does it, Virginia does it. So you can definitely find these Bills of Rights. The thing is, however, that even those Bills of Rights resemble the English Bill of Rights in that they're mostly preoccupied with limiting the power of the executive or protecting the power of the legislative branch. And they don't speak in a language that confers rights to individuals. The language they use is more declaratory, like you ought to have a right, but not the state shall not infringe upon your rights. So again, we're just making this intellectual space here to think about the Federal Bill of Rights, which will be ratified in 1791, as coming out of a tradition where we're protecting the people from an overreaching government.
Okay. So now my next influence here is a principle. It's not an event. And this is the principle of federalism. Federalism is, of course, the division of power between different levels of government. And American constitutionalism is always concerned with federalism, even from, from day one of Jamestown, because you always have a colonial level of government, and then you've got a, a more central level of government. So even when we get rid of king and parliament, we replace that sort of federalism with a confederation congress. And then we get rid of that and we play, replace it with the same national government we have today. And along the way, we're, we're sort of constantly figuring out how the one government exercises power versus the other. But federalism is all about protecting liberty because divided power and therefore limited power means liberty. Liberty can flourish when power is divided and checked. And so the American Bill of Rights that we eventually have tacked onto our constitution is totally concerned with preserving this principle of federalism in its original uh, uh, configuration, original intention rather behind it. The final principle uh, that informs the Bill of Rights that I'm going to discuss with you today uh, is popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty means we the people are the ultimate location for all authority. It's not the king, it's not the parliament, it's not our president, it's not our Congress, it's not our state assemblyman, it's not our state senator, it's we the people. And popular sovereignty is a, an American innovation. Uh, England had in the 17th and 18th century, it's king and parliament, they're the ones who are sovereign. So when we go it alone in our independence, we have this new principle that sort of undergirds our constitutions, but it is by no means clear how this works and if it will work in the long term. So the Bill of Rights that gets attached to the US Constitution is fundamentally concerned with protecting this idea of we, the people, are in charge. Popular sovereignty needs to be maintained, and the 10 amendments aim to do that. So the way that the 10 amendments even come into existence um, derives from uh, not only the context I've been describing to you, but anti-federalists who are very concerned that this new US constitution written by 55 delegates in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, that document creates a central government that is too strong. That's what the anti-federalists worry. And as the ratification conventions happen in the various states, eventually there's enough pushback from anti-federalists who say something to the effect of, hey, you know, if, if we're going to end up ratifying this thing, you need, you federalists who are in support of the constitution, you need to give us some assurances that the power of this central government you're creating will be checked. And in fact, so many anti-federalists say this across so many states that in fact, when the newly ratified constitution uh, is in place and the new Congress, the first Congress in fact, opens up for business in 1789, the first thing on the docket in the House of Representatives is working on this Bill of Rights to make good on that compromise, to make good on that promise to the anti-federalists. The uh, Congress in 1789 first uh, passed 12 amendments, but only 10 of those amendments are eventually ratified by the states. And those 10 amendments constitute the document that I assigned to you as your primary source and we'll take a look at in a few minutes. So the next thing I'd like to chat with you about um, is, I, I mentioned this earlier, there's sort of a secondary argument um, that the Bill of Rights has. It's not just here are 10 amendments that when you look at them all together are meant to protect the majority's rights. 
The secondary argument it makes is, and also this Bill of Rights wants to protect certain key institutions that in the 18th century are really important for keeping the people in charge, keeping the popular sovereignty. And those three institutions are the militia, churches, and juries. So let's briefly talk about each of them. First of all, militias. Um, in the 18th century, um, a state-sponsored militia um, is composed of any able-bodied man who can grab a weapon and muster on the town square and protect their community. And militias, which are protected in our Bill of Rights by the Second and Third Amendments, militias are important for this principle of popular sovereignty, partly because militias um, are, are a place where community members come together to learn about what government is doing and decide whether or not what it's doing is necessary. But most importantly, militias check governments. And if, if you needed any convincing that militias were, uh, were important in the 18th century, just think about what to them was the recent past. The American Revolution fought partly by state militias who not only defended their local communities, but in some cases repelled the British or stopped them, stopped them in their tracks and helped to win our independence. So there was no, no guarantee that now that we have a new form of a central government, the militia wouldn't need to be called out to defend our local communities against that overreach too. So militias therefore, are an important force for people, citizens, to learn about what government does and to check it with violence if necessary. The second institution, which is protected by the First Amendment, are churches. And churches do a number of things to reinforce this principle of popular sovereignty, but the most important of the things that uh, churches end up doing is to create virtuous citizens to teach citizens the difference between right and wrong and how to put the community's public good above your individual selfishness. Churches are also a place um, where citizens can learn about their communities, learn about each other, talk about what government is doing and decide whether or not they like what government is doing. So churches are, are places where good virtuous Republican citizens can chat and remain watchful of their government. But finally, and by far in a way the most important of these institutions protected by the Bill of Rights that underscore the principle of popular sovereignty are juries. And juries are protected in the American Bill of Rights um, across amendments number five, six, and seven. And those three different amendments reflect the three kinds of juries that we inherit from um, England and English legal tradition. So they include the grand jury and grand juries are the 23 or so in the 18th century men who decide whether or not their fellow community member should be indicted and then prosecuted for crime, for, for committing a crime. The second um, kind of jury is the petty jury or the criminal jury. And this is the jury where, if you're thinking about like Law and Order, which is always one of my favorite TV shows, and you think about Law and Order and like the DA Sam, um, uh, Jack McCoy, um, at the end of the episode, is waiting for the jury, which is a criminal or a petty jury to make its decision. And that jury is deciding guilty or not guilty about a fellow community member. That's the criminal jury. And then finally, the, the uh, third kind of jury also sits in judgment, but over a different kind of legal matter. And this is the civil jury. And civil juries um, sit in judgment over disputes that arise between individuals like a contract dispute or negligence or something like that. So similar, but not criminal prosecutions. And these juries are so important in the 18th century for maintaining the principle of popular sovereignty because 
Not only are juries a place where citizens can learn about what government does, but juries are places where you can watch the government in action. And most important, you can check the government without resorting to violence. Because juries are places where uh, the people actually have a say in government as a check and a balance to what their agents are doing. In fact, there's one anti-federalist who calls the juries the lower branch of the, the, the lower branch of the judicial department, is, is, is the quote. And what he means by that is juries are sort of like the assembly is in a legislature where the upper house in this meta, in this analogy, the upper house is the judge and the juries are the people's voice in the lower house. So, okay. Now I'm talking a lot in the abstract here. I'd like to give you one example of how powerful juries especially can be. And this example is one that our founding generation, they absolutely knew it. They thought about it. It was not far from anyone's mind. Um, I, I think it's sort of like how uh, people in, in my generation or maybe even my parents' generation just know what the O.J. Simpson trial is. It's just a touchstone. And the John Peter Zenger case is that kind of touchstone for the 18th century. So I'd like to describe it to you. And um, uh, I'll, I'll do that by first giving you the context of the case, the facts that make the, the, the case actually come before court. Then I'll tell you about the law because there's actually some funky stuff going on in this particular kind of case. And then finally, finally, I'll get to the punchline, which is the reason why everybody knows the Zenger case, how the jury checks the power of the crown and why it's so therefore well-known, okay? So here we go, the John Peter Zenger case. Here's the context. It arises out of colonial New York uh, in the early 1730s. New York, the colony of New York gets a new royal governor and his name is William Cosby. And when Cosby comes on the scene, he is immediately disliked and not just because he's an agent of the crown, but he's immediately disliked because he, the, the first thing he does is like a jerk kind of move. He wants to sue his predecessor in office, who was only an acting interim governor, but Cosby wants to sue the acting governor for the acting governor's salary. For some reason, Cosby thinks that should be his money. So this is very unpopular. It looks very greedy. It looks like, what are you doing? Why, why is this your first move? But then he does something else that elevates what looks just like a greedy move to the level of, hey, you're a petty tyrant. Cosby is thinking about what court should I take my salary dispute to? And the obvious choice, the court where he should be filing his lawsuit is the New York Supreme Court, which would be sitting with a jury to determine whether or not Cosby should get this money. But Cosby knows the juries won't like what he's trying to do here. So he fears that a jury will not give him a favorable result. So the only other option for him at New York, in New York, is to go to this other kind of court called a chancery. And chanceries don't have juries, which Cosby would like, but as governor, Cosby is the judge of the chancery court. So he can't sit in judgment of his own dispute and therefore chancery is out. So what Cosby ends up doing is creating or wanting to create, he, he starts the process moving of creating a new court, a brand new court in this colony of New York that would sit without a jury and where he would staff it with his friends who are judges who then presumably would decide in his favor. That's what Cosby wants to do. And that is perceived, that little end run around jury trials and that constituting your own court just to hear your dispute, that seems like a lot of corruption. And that's why he kind of comes off as a petty tyrant. The opposition party in New York is all about criticizing him. 
And John Peter Zenger happens to be the printer for the opposition party. So he is printing all of these articles which are critical of Governor Cosby and point out how he's doing an end run around juries. But because John Peter Zenger is printing these articles critical of the governor, he gets in trouble and he is arrested and prosecuted for committing the crime of seditious libel. Okay, so that's the context, here's the law. Seditious libel is a crime, and the crime is that if you publish anything that is seditious, um, which means in this context, anything from advocating overthrowing the government to mild criticism that just disrupts uh, people's trust in government, anything like that, uh, you can be fined or thrown in jail if you were found guilty. So John Peter Zenger definitely published stuff that was critical of, of government and Cosby is taking him to task for it. The other thing that's interesting and funky about a seditious libel uh, charge is that even though it's a criminal offense to commit seditious libel, um, the, the jury, that petty jury I mentioned a moment ago, doesn't get to act like it does in a law and order episode. What I mean by that is the, the jury doesn't get to decide is Zenger guilty or not guilty. For any other criminal offense, it would, but not for seditious libel. When it comes to seditious libel trials, you can only, the jury only decides on a narrow question of whether or not Zenger printed the offending material. And the judge decides whether or not the material is in fact seditious. Now, in Zenger's case, all of the facts, reality, points to the fact that he printed this stuff. Okay, there's really no doubt about it. And moreover, his lawyer doesn't even try to make the case to the jury that he didn't print it. Everyone knows he did. But the reason why Zenger goes down is this sort of ringing endorsement of juries, why our founding generation knows this case so very well is because even though the jury had only that little narrow window to decide, did he print the material or not? And obviously he did. The jury takes that little bit of leverage, that slight opportunity to stick it to the crown. And the jury decides Zenger did not print those articles. And by making that determination, Zenger is off scot-free. So in other words, the jury, for whatever reason, because they didn't like the fact that Zenger was printing the truth and being punished for it, because they thought Governor Cosby was in the wrong and they wanted to stick it to him, for whatever reason, the jury used its power to watch the government, to evaluate what it was doing, and to check it. And that is why juries in the 18th century are seen as such powerful tools to maintain that voice of the people. Now, one final comment here about the Zenger case. Notice how John Peter Zenger's case, which I am bringing up to you to talk about the power of juries, not only underscores why protecting a criminal jury is important to we the people, but notice also how Zenger's jury trial reinforced another one of the rights of the people protected in the Bill of Rights, the freedom of the press. So the jury is therefore a crucial tool in protecting other rights because of its ability to check the government. Okay, I know that my time is, is now coming to an end. So I wanna end my presentation here with just one final um, little bit of um, acknowledgements for you that you know, if you came into this presentation today and you were thinking, yeah, the Bill of Rights protects my individual right to own a gun or my individual right to a speedy trial or my individual right to say unpopular things. I just spent a half hour suggesting to you that the original Bill of Rights was not intended on protecting those individual rights, right? The argument is that this original Bill of Rights protects the majority's rights. 
But you're not wrong to think that the Bill of Rights today in the 21st century mostly is used to protect your individual rights. So how then do we get from what I'm arguing is the original position for the Bill of Rights, majority's rights, to today when the Bill of Rights is used to protect individual rights? The answer is reconstruction. And of course, one of the most important things to come out of reconstruction, the 14th Amendment which is why section one of the 14th amendment was on your primary source uh, document for today. Because um, when America goes through the civil war and then through the reconstruction period, the 14th amendment and its addition to the constitution really changes the game. If you notice in that section one of the 14th amendment, the language is no state shall, and so no longer is the 14th Amendment uh, and the US Constitution therefore only referring to protecting us from national government overreach. Now we're protecting us from the states too. And it is through that language, no state shall, plus the equally broad language of uh, the privileges or immunities clause and the due process clauses in that section one of the 14th amendment where now judges take clauses from the bill of rights which usually only apply to the federal government and now apply them to the states. So now no state shall uh, infringe upon your ability to say unpopular things or to have a gun or to have a speedy trial. So that process is called incorporation, the process of taking the Bill of Rights, which is supposed to apply only to the federal government, now through the 14th Amendment, apply it to the states. And that's how we arrive at the place we are now, where the Bill of Rights effectively protects your political minority rights. If you have things to say and the majority disagrees with you, you're protected. If you want to have a gun, but the majority wants to regulate it, you are protected, et cetera, et cetera. So we have arrived in a place where now the Bill of Rights is used to protect individual rights. But we wouldn't be here without that intervening 14th Amendment to change the way we think of the Bill of Rights. 